Bless God for a new calendar year of uh, Sunday school and we thank God for what he did last year. We thank God for what he did last year calendar. We are all welcome to this year's Sunday school series. Let us pray. Father, we thank you. We worship you, Lord. We thank you for your ever abiding presence. We thank you for your transformational words. We thank you for the topics, the series last year. We thank you for blessing us so much. And we pray that this year, Jehovah, you bless us tremendously. In the mighty name of Jesus, we pray, Jehovah, that you give us understanding of what we need to know in order to know you better. We pray that our eyes of understanding will be open to all the mysteries in your word in this calendar here. And we pray that the Lord, that every blessing loaded for us in the manual, we receive in the mighty name of Jesus, even as we receive Turn all the glory unto you. In Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed. Amen. Today we'll be looking at the topic, keys to knowing God. Last week we'll, we looked at the question, who is our God? And we considered God as the uncreated creator and a unique God. But this morning we'll be looking at the keys to knowing God. And we'll be taking our memory verse from the book of John 17, Verse 3, turn with me to John 17, verse 3. As we take our memory verse, it says, And this is life eternal, that they might know thee, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. John 17, verse 3. And we'll be taking our Bible passage from the book of Acts, Acts 17, 22 to 27. Acts 17, 22 to 27, I read. Then Paul stood in the midst of Mars Hill and said, Ye men of Athens, I perceive that in all things you are too super superstitious. For as I passed by and beheld your devotions, I found an altar with this inscription to the unknown God, whom therefore ye ignorantly worship him. Him declare I unto you. God that had made the world and all things therein, seeing that he is Lord of heaven and earth, dwelleth not in temples made with hands. Verse 25. Neither is worshipped with men's hands, as though he needed anything, seeing he honor to all life and breath and all things. Verse 26. And hath made of one blood all nations of men for to dwell on all the face of the earth and at the time in the times before appointed, and the bounds of their habitation. Verse 27, the last verse. That they should seek the Lord, if aptly they might feel after him, and find him, though he be not far from every one of us. Apostle Paul discovered there the idolatrous tendencies of the Athens Jews in his address, and he told them, he admonished them, that we should seek God. And we are rest assured that when you seek God, you will find him. Keys to knowing God. The lesson introduction says, Within all of us, there exists a strong desire to be known and to know others. More importantly, there's a void in every individual, a quest to know their creator, even if they are not professed believers in God. Then Apostle Paul addressed and expressed his desire to truly know God in Philippians 3.10. He says that I may know him and identify with the suffering of the Lord Jesus Christ. It is therefore important to address the issue of seeking and truly knowing God. And that's what we are set to address this morning, the issues of truly knowing God. We'll move on to the first lesson outline, which says, seeking God is inevitable. Seeking God is inevitable. Our desire to seek and to know more of God is the essence of true life. According to our memory verse that we read, 
Our desire to seek and to know more of God is the essence of true life, according to John 17, verse 3. Then the thoughts of God should be paramount in our minds because they will determine the value and the direction of our lives. The thoughts of God should be paramount in our minds. Turn with me to the book of Psalms as we see what the scripture says here. Psalm 48, verse 9. We are told that the thought of God should be uppermost in our mind. He says, we have thought of thy loving kindness. We have thought of thy loving kindness, O God, in the midst of thy temple. Also, seeking God then is an ongoing responsibility and privilege for all Christians. Is our privilege, is our responsibility to seek God. And the assurance that we have is that when we seek him, then we shall find him. According to Job 5, 8, it says it's a responsibility and privilege for all Christians to seek God. Therefore, the scripture admonish, admonishes us to seek God. The scripture admonishes us to seek God. How? How do we seek this our God, our maker? We seek him wholeheartedly. Wholeheartedly, we are to seek God with the all of our heart, with the bread of our life. Deuteronomy verse 4 29 says we should seek God with everything that is in us. But if from thence thou shalt seek the Lord thy God, thou shalt find him. Hallelujah. It means when we seek him, we shall find him. If thou seek him with all thy heart, and with all thy soul, all utterly. Therefore, the scripture also admonishes us to seek God early in life. While we are still young, we are admonished to seek God. According to the book of Ecclesiastes chapter 12, verse 1, it says, Remember now thy creator in the days of thy youth, while the evil days come not, nor the years draw nigh, when thou shalt say, I have no pleasure in them. We have been admonished to seek God early in life. Then we are to seek God continually. We are to seek God as children of God continually, which can be found in the book of Psalm 105, verse 4. Turn with me to the book of Psalm 105, verse 4. It says, seek the Lord and his strength. Seek his face evermore. Forever and ever, we are to seek our maker. Then we are to seek God with joy. Thank God this is a year of perfect jubilee. When you talk about jubilation, you talk about joy. We are to seek God with joy. Then let's also look at what the scripture says about seeking God. We are to seek God by prayer and supplication. The book of 1 Thessalonians 5.17 says, Pray without Season. So we are to seek God in our prayer life and through supplications as well. We are also to seek God with fasting. According to the book of Daniel chapter 9 verse 3, we seek God with fasting because there are some certain things that we need in our life that will not go except we turn to God in the place of fasting and prayer. Then lastly, okay, second to the last, we are to seek God through his righteousness. We are to seek God through his righteousness. According to the book of Matthew 6, verse 33, we are to seek God through his righteousness. It says, but seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Then every other thing that we desire will be added unto us. We are also to seek God by studying his word. 2 Timothy 2, 25 says that we should study the word, we should study the word of God, and when we study his word, we will be blessed therein. Say, study to show yourself approved, a workman that needed not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. Then assuredly, those who seek God under the conditions stated above, what will happen to them? Those who seek God, considering all those conditions, those who seek God will find him. When you seek him, you find him. According to the word of God, he has his word for us and we have his backing. According to the book of Jeremiah 29 verse 13. Let's turn our Bible to Jeremiah 29 verse 13. He says, and ye shall seek me and find me. When we seek him, we'll find him. When ye shall search for me with all your hearts. 
and that's when we talk about all heartedly, then we'll find him. Let's also look at the conditions. When we follow the conditions stated above, what will happen to those who seek God? Those who seek God will be satisfied. When you seek God, you will receive satisfaction. You can turn your Bible with me to the book of Matthew 5, verse 6. Matthew 5, verse 6. It says, Blessed are they which do hunger and test after righteousness, for they shall be filled. So when you hunger, when you thirst after righteousness, then you can be rest assured that you'll be filled. Those who see God will understand all things because it will open our eyes of understanding. Then those who seek God will not lack any good thing. When you seek God, you will not lack any good thing. In line with the word of God in the book of Psalm 34, verse 10, he says, The long lions do lack and suffer hunger, but they that seek the Lord shall not want any good thing. Hallelujah. What a glorious promise. When we seek God, we will not lack any good thing. I love that. So let's move on to the second lesson outline, which talks about keys to truly knowing God. What are the keys to truly knowing God? The first one says, receive Jesus Christ into your life. Receive Jesus Christ into your life. Jesus makes it clear that he alone is a way to heaven and personal knowledge of God. So you want to know God, you want to seek God, you come in through the channel of Jesus Christ. According to the book of John 14, verses 6 to 9. In an attempt to know God, we must also understand that the Bible is God's word and a revelation of himself, his promises, and his will. The Bible is the word of God and... When we want to know God the more, we must understand that the Bible is God's word and a revelation of himself, his promises, and his will. According to the book of John chapter 1 verse 1, he says, In the beginning was the word, and the word was with God, and the word was God himself. So we want to seek him, we want to know him, we should identify with the scripture. The Bible is essentially a love letter written to us from a loving God who created us to know him intimately. The Bible is a love letter. That's amazing. The Bible is a love letter written to the children of God to know him more and to have a relationship with him. Let's also look at um, other points that we have here. In an attempt to know God, we must be committed to obeying what we read in the scripture. It means that it is not only enough to read, but we must obey what the scripture says. We were created to do good works, according to what the scripture says in the book of Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. And not only must we read and understand God's word, but we must also apply the doctrines there. Yes, we'll read the word of God, we'll meditate on the word of God, but that's not enough. We should also apply the doctrines that are there and obediently follow the word of God and remain faithful and remain faithful. Turn with me to the book of James chapter 1. Let's look at verses 21 to 22. We are still considering the point that is not enough for us to study the word, but we should also apply the principles that are daring. Verse 22 says, but, ye, but be ye doers of the word, and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. So we have been admonished this morning that we should not only be the hearer of the word, but also applying the principles of the word of God and the doctrines. Praise the Lord. Then lastly, we also have been committed to prayers, personal devotion, fellowship with brethren, and always worshiping God in spirit and in truth. I mean, the second to the last point here, it says, be committed to prayer, personal devotion, fellowship with brethren, according to the book of Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. Turn with me to Hebrews 10, 
verse 25, we are to be committed to our prayer life, personal devotion, and fellowshipping with brethren. These are all in ingredients to be able to stand firm and to know God the more. Verse 25 says, not forsaking the assembling of ourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhorting one another and so much the more as you see the day approaching. So in an attempt to know God, we must be committed to prayer, personal devotion, fellowship with brethren, and we should always worship God in spirit and in truth. Then we should also allow the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us always. We should always allow the Holy Spirit to lead and guide us always. Then our lives will be filled with God and we can experience him intimately. In summary, seeking God is inevitable and there are ways to truly know God. And in conclusion, if we genuinely hunger and test to know God, he will reveal himself to us. And I pray that the Lord Almighty will reveal himself unto us. Let us pray. Father, we ask that you empower us to pay the price, to truly seek you and to know you. We ask for empowerment from above, to seek you and to know you. To God alone, behold the glory. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. Hallelujah, hallelujah. Bless the name Jesus. Bless the name Jesus. Bless the Lord, oh my soul, and everything that is within me. Bless his holy name. His name is wonderful. His name is Counselor, the mighty God, everlasting Father. We worship you. We exalt your name, Jesus. Oh. Thank you for saving me. Thank you, my Lord. Thank you for saving me. Thank you, my Lord. Thank you for saving me. Thank you, my Lord. Thank you for saving me. Thank you, my Lord. Thank you for healing me. Thank you, my Lord. Thank you for healing me. Thank you, my Lord. By your stripes, I've been healed. Thank you for healing me. Thank you, my Lord. Thank you for loving me. Thank you, my Lord. Thank you for loving me. Thank you, my Lord. Thank you for raising me. Yeah. Thank you, Jehovah. You raised me up with Jesus. Thank you, my Lord. And I see that the right hand of God at the right hand of power. Thank you, my Lord. We give you glory, Lord, as we worship you. Hallelujah. We give you glory, Lord, as we honor you.
Heaven and earth adore you. Angels bound to worship you. You are the only living God. Jesus, Jesus. From the rising of the sun and unto the going down of the same. Only your name is to be praised. Jesus, oh, Jesus. For Jesus. told that be rest.
to God in the highest. Let somebody shout hallelujah. It's another time in God's presence to listen to God's word. And we know that as the rain falleth down on the earth, and it watereth the earth and make it to board, it gives bread to the eater, it gives seed to the sower. We know the word of God is coming again. Let's leave the name of the Lord and appreciate his holy name. Let's bless him because we know that he will yet speak to us again. We know that line upon line, we know precept upon precept. We know a little here, a little there. We know that we are going higher. Let's thank him for glorious things that he has spoken in the past. Let's thank him for great times that we have had in his presence. God has never left us without a teacher. The Bible says that if man eat the bread of adversity and drink the water of affliction, he said that uh, may God not take teachers away from them. Let's thank God because he has not taken teachers away from us. God has a resident his grace in our Father in the Lord. The world had been coming every week. We have been a beneficiary of it. Let's thank God for that which he has done. Because when we appreciate him for what he has done, it's an application for what we want him to do. Let's give him all the glory. Let's give him all the praise. Let's give him all the thanks. I'd like us to also cry to God Almighty, committing the vessel that he's going to use to speak to us today. Let's pray that God's hand will rest upon him. God will give him utterance. We will not hear what we want to hear, but what God wants us to hear. 
that our ears, we hear a voice behind us telling us that this is the way that we should go. Let's pray that the Lord will enlarge him. The Lord will speak through him. And let's pray that every word will enter right inside the heart. Let's pray that it's going to produce results in our lives. In the mighty name of Jesus. I want us to ask for fresh oil, more grace, strength for him. And we pray that everything that God will do through him and every other day, that he will continually lead men back to the cross of Calvary. Thank you, Heavenly Father. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Eternal Father, we thank you for another opportunity to drink from the fountain of your word. Thank you because the word will always move us from victory to victory. Accept our thanks in the mighty name of Jesus. For the ones we have had in the past and the ones we will hear today, we pray that that word will produce results in our lives. It will make a better Christian of us in the name of Jesus. By the time we look around, we will see that we have moved higher. We pray for your choice, son, our father in the Lord, that you will be using again today. Let your oil be fresh upon him. Lay your mighty hands upon him and let that word, let it come like an hammer, even let it come, O oh Lord, as a sword that is piercing unto the soul. Thank you, because at the end of the day, our lives will never remain the same. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Praise the Lord. Let somebody shout hallelujah. We are thankful to God today that we have come to the table of the word of God, to the table of the feast of the word of God. We appreciate the name of the Lord for a father in the Lord that the ear the boy that God has raised to raise many generals in this generation. May the Lord continue to bless you, Daddy, in the name of Jesus. In Genesis chapter 1, verse 3, Genesis 1, 3, and God said, let there be light. And there was light. The word of God is the agent of light. In Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. This book of the law shall not depart out of thy mouth. But thou shalt meditate therein day and night. That thou mayest observe to do according to all that is written therein. For then... Thou shalt make thy ways prosperous, and then thou shalt have good success. So, the word of God is a carrier of power, carrier of success. There is nothing you want to attain or you want to achieve in life without the word. And so, the word is coming your way today again. Heaven and earth shall pass away. But nothing will pass away from the word of God. Daddy, he had the boy is loaded with the word of God. And I'm believing God for great delivery into my life, into your life. As I will invite Pastor Kunle Ajayi to bring a daddy in the Lord into the podium. God will bless you as you partake of the feast of the word of God in Jesus' name.
let us pray. There is none holy as the Lord, as the Lord. There is none beside thee, beside thee, neither is there any rock like our God. There Father and our God, we worship you because there is none as holy as our God. Thank you because your holiness guarantees your faithfulness. It guarantees that all your promises are yea and amen. It guarantees that by your grace our tomorrow will be all right. Please accept our thanks in Jesus' name. Amen. Lord, even as your children gather together again to worship you, we pray that you will send forth your word, Amen. and your word will bring us healings Amen. and bring deliverance to the oppressed. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. 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 Praise the Lord. Well, I think you want to wave at one or two people near you and say, uh, good day, God bless you. And then you may please be seated. As we continue with our series and we go on to Going Higher, Part 71. Going Higher, Part 71. And we will be looking at First Kings chapter 20. First Kings chapter 20. We'll be reading from verse 26 to 1st Kings chapter 20 from verse 26 to 29. And it came to pass at the return of the year that Ben Hadad numbered the Syrians and went up to Hafek to fight against Israel. And the children of Israel were numbered and were all present and went against them. And the children of Israel pitched before them like two little flocks of kids. But the Syrians filled the country. And there came a man of God and spake unto the king of Israel and said, Thus saith the Lord, because the Syrians have said, The Lord is God of the hills but is not God of the valleys. 
Therefore will I deliver all this great multitude into thy hand, and ye shall know that I am the Lord. And they pitched one over against the other seven days. And so it was that in the seventh day the battle was joined, and the children of Israel slew of the Syrians a hundred thousand footmen in one day. First King chapter 20 is an extremely beautiful piece of scripture. Yes, the name of Elijah is not mentioned here. But we can't just allow this particular chapter go untouched. The story tells us about war between the king of Syria and the king of Israel. They fought the year before, and the children of Israel defeated the children of Syria. And then the advisors of the king of Israel of uh, Syria said to him, Sir, the reason we lost the battle is because we fought these people on a mountain top. Their God or their gods are gods of the mountain and not gods of the valley. So next time we fight them, let's fight them in the valley. We will defeat them then. And God had them and sent a man of God, one of those uh, 7,000 that God has preserved, to go and tell the king of Israel, these people said, I'm a God of the hills, I'm not God of the valley. I will show them. We will fight them in the valley, and I will hand over their entire army to you. The Bible described for us graphically the kind of opposition that came against the king of Israel. He said, when the entire Israel army was gathered together. They were like two little flocks of sheep. But the Syrians filled the land. And yet, when the battle was joined, the children of Israel slew of the Syrians a hundred thousand footmen in one day. So what we want to discuss briefly today is that our God is the God of the hills as well as the God of the valley. We know already that God is constant. Malachi chapter 3, verse 6. Malachi 3, verse 6. I am the Lord, I change not. That's what the Almighty God said. Hebrews chapter 13, verse 8. Hebrews 13, verse 8. Says, Jesus Christ is same yesterday, today, and forever. Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. Revelation chapter 1, verse 8. It says, I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the ending, the one who was, the one who is, the one who is to come, the Almighty. We know that the past, the present, the future, they all meet in our God. We know he does not change. We know that whatever he had done before, he can do it again. For example, 
we know that he can make a way where there's no way. Because in Exodus chapter 14, from verse 21 to 28, Exodus 14, 21 to 28, he made a way in the Red Sea. Where there had been no way before, he made a way. And then when we go to Joshua chapter 3, from verse 15 to 17, Joshua 3, 15 to 17, he made a way in River Jordan, clave River Jordan into two. And he repeated the same feat again in 2 Kings chapter 2, from verse 6 to 8. 2 Kings 2, 6 to 8. Again, he opened the Jordan for Elijah and Elisha to pass through. And the same day, he repeated the same miracle in 2 Kings chapter 2, from verse 13 to 14. 2 Kings 2, 13 to 14. This time, he opened the Jordan to Elisha alone, because Elijah had then been taken up to heaven. We know that God is constant, time-wise. And whatever he had done before, he can do again. And I'm praying for every one of you trusting God for an opening. God will make a way for you today. In 2 Kings chapter 4, from verse 42 to 44, 2 Kings chapter 4, from verse 42 to 44, the Bible tells us that somebody brought a little bit of food to Elisha. And he told his servant to present the food to his people so they could eat. And the servant said to him, Sir, this little food for a hundred people? And the man of God said, Give it to them. They will eat, they will be full, and they will be left over. And that was exactly what happened. That was in the Old Testament. In the New Testament, in John chapter 6, from verse 5 to 13, John 6, 5 to 13, we found that with five loaves of bread and two fishes, the same almighty God repeated that miracle. He multiplied the bread, multiplied the uh, fish, thousands ate, and the sea had 12 baskets left over. He is the same yesterday, today, and tomorrow. He can turn something little to something big. He can provide miraculously. He's done it before. He can do it again. And for those of you who are facing scarcity right now, I'm decreeing in the mighty name of Jesus Christ that your little will soon become more than enough. Amen. But more importantly, is that it's not only constant in time, it's constant in space. Is constant on the mountain top, is constant in the valley. The same God on the mountain top is the same God in the valley below. So it doesn't matter where you are, God is constant. In Genesis 39, from verse 1 to 6, Genesis 39, 1 to 6, the Bible tells us that in Potiphar's house, and Potiphar was a great man, 
a great officer of Pharaoh. So I can, I can imagine that his house was a mansion. God was there with Joseph. When Joseph was prospering and he was heading the uh, entire establishment of Potiphar, it was God. When Joseph landed in prison, Genesis 39, from verse 21 to 23, Genesis 39, 21 to 23, in prison, God was still, still with Joseph. Is the God on the hill when everything is going fine? Is God in the valley when things are not so beautiful? On Mount Carmel, in First Kings chapter 18, from verse 36 to 46, First Kings 18, from verse 36 to 46, God was God. When Elijah prayed and fire fell. When he prayed and rain fell. When he ran a race and he outran the chariot of the king, it was God. When he got to the valley below in Jezreel, in 1 Kings chapter 19 from verse 1 to 8, 1 Kings 19, from verse 1 to 8, God was still God. When the enemy was roaring, say, by tomorrow you'll be dead. When Elijah was so low, he was considering suicide. God was still there, ready to feed him ready to encourage him, ready to get him going again. It doesn't matter where you are now. Are you on the mountain top? Are you praying and God is answering by fire? Are you getting results just as soon as you make the request? Don't forget if you ever find yourself in a low situation when it doesn't appear as if God is near, when the enemy seems to be the one who is calling the shots, just remember, the God on the mountain is the God in the valley. In Matthew chapter 17 from verse 1 to 9, Matthew 17 from verse 1 to 9. On the Mount of Transfiguration, when the Almighty was transformed before Peter, James, and John, and his glory was dazzling, everything was so beautiful that Peter said, oh, I wish we'd just stay here. It was God. When they got down to the valley below, in the same Matthew 17, from verse 14 to 18, Matthew 17, from verse 14 to 18, and they found that the other disciples left behind were struggling with a demon, trying to cast him out, and nothing was happening. God still showed up. Many a times when we come to a convention or a congress and everybody's around and miracles are happening and we are hearing beautiful testimonies, oh, we feel high. When the convention is over or the congress is gone and we're back home, occasionally we find ourselves facing some problems. And we begin to wonder, is the God on the mountain still the God in the valley? I believe God is asking me to assure you today 
The God on the mountain is the God in the valley. I want you to know that wherever you are, when the glory is shining and everything is beautiful, and you are shouting hallelujah, and you are praising God. If at any time you find yourself in a situation completely different from the one you knew before, just remember, God is still there. The God of the mountain is the God of the valley. The influence of the Most High God links the hilltop and the valley below. It controls every situation. It's everywhere at all times. In Exodus 17, from verse 8 to 13, Exodus 17, 8 to 13, you know the story very well. When the Amalekites came to attack the children of Israel, and Moses went to the mountain top, took Aaron and Hall with him. And Joshua was in the valley below, fighting. You know the story. As long as Moses was raising his hand to the God of the heavens, victory was being wrought downstairs. When you have a battle to fight, when it looks as if you, you, you don't even know how you can ever overcome. It would be a good idea to go to the hilltop and cry to the God of the hills. He will give you results in the valley below. The Bible tells us that he is seated in the heavens and from there is controlling the earth. Isaiah 66 verse 1, Isaiah 66 verse 1 says, Heaven is my throne, the earth is my footstool. That tells you that the God we are serving is so big that while he may be seated in heaven, his legs are firmly planted on the earth. From where he is in heaven, he's controlling whatever is going on here on earth. Remember Philippians chapter 2 from verse 9 to 11. Philippians 2 9 to 11 assures us that at the name of Jesus Christ every knee should bow not only in heaven but right here on earth. Oh yes, Jesus is seated in the heavenly places according to Ephesians chapter 1 from verse 17 to 23, Ephesians 1, 17 to 23, he is seated in the heavens, but he's controlling what's going on here. As a matter of fact, when he says at his name, all knees will bow, it's not so much about those that are in heaven. Nobody disobeys him in heaven. The devil has been driven out. What he's trying to get you to understand is that every knee here on earth must bow to the one who is seated in the heavenly places. And that his influence is all compassing from heaven to the earth, even to underneath the earth. As you are growing higher in the Lord, you need to get one thing absolutely clear. Between every hill, there's usually a valley. And to go from one hill, from one hilltop to another, you may need to pass through a valley. Elijah was on Mount Carmel in 1 Kings chapter 18. And then in 1 Kings chapter 19, that we read from verse 1 to 8, he was in Jezreel 
in the valley below. But by the time you read First King chapter 18, sorry, First King chapter 19 from verse 8 to 18, First King chapter 19 from verse 8 to 18, it was again on another mountain, the mountain of Horeb, called the mountain of God. On Mount Carmel, he was there to demonstrate the power of God. In Israel, he came face to face with the representative of the devil. But by the end of the story, he was on Mount Horeb, the very mountain of God himself. You must note that, that as you pass through this journey on your way to heaven. There will be times on the mountain. There could be times in the valley. But the same God who was with you on that mountain will be with you in the valley and then take you to even a higher mountain still. You know very well that in Matthew chapter 16 from verse 13 to 19, Matthew 16 from verse 13 to 19, Jesus Christ said to Peter, when he made a great statement, he said, ah, you are blessed. Flesh and blood are not revealed this to you. You, you, you. you are well done. You are in contact with God. But then you know very well, it wasn't too long after that, that Peter had to go out and weep bitterly when he found himself in a great valley. Matthew chapter 26, from verse 69 to 75. But it wasn't too long after that, that Peter was preaching a single sermon that won 3,000 souls on the day of Pentecost. I'm here to encourage you today, wherever you are, God is there. If you are going through a night nice season, just remember, weeping may endure for a night, but joy comes in the morning. The God of the mountain is also the God of the valley. Before we pray, if you don't have God by your side, whether you are on the mountain or you are in the valley, you are on your own. And it can be a very terrible thing to be on your own particularly when you feel you are on the mountain top, when you think you are big, you are in charge, you are rich, you are in control of every situation because after the mountain, the valley will come. And if God is not on your side on the mountain, he won't be on your side in the valley. That's why you must surrender your life to Jesus Christ. That's why you must invite him into your life. So that whether mountain or valley, you will have a companion. So if you would love to surrender your life to Jesus Christ, I would love to pray with you now. If you will bow your head and call on him and say, please come into my life. From now on, whether on the mountain top or in the valley below, I want to be sure that you are with me. If you want to pray that prayer, calling on him for salvation, please bow your head wherever you may be, and I will pray with you for the salvation of your soul. Please do so now. Call on him and say, Lord, please come into my life. Take over from now so that for the rest of my life, I will have the assurance that you are with me. Call on him now. And I will pray with you at this moment. 
In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. My Father, my God, I want to thank you for your word. And I want to thank you for all the people who have decided that they want to now in their lives, that they, they are surrendering completely to you. Father, please receive them. Save their souls. Let your blood wash away their sins. Receive them into the family of God. And please, Father, be with them for the rest of their lives. So that whether they are on the mountain top or in the valley, you will always be there. Thank you, my Father and my God. And I'm praying for your children. Those who are rejoicing now, please let them know that if anything should go wrong, you are still there for them. And if they are in trouble right now, my Father and my God, please show up too so you can move them to even a higher mountain. In Jesus' mighty name, we have prayed. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Now I want to rejoice with those of you who have given your life to Jesus. I will want you to please contact me as soon as possible, and I promise you I'll be praying for you. And please contact the nearest Redeemed Christian Church of God to you. Tell the pastor you have just given your life to Jesus, and he will tell you what to do next. God bless you. Praise the Lord. Let somebody shout hallelujah. What a wonderful word that we have heard this afternoon again. That our God is always constant. And whatever he has done before, he can do it again. So no matter your financial situation, God is ready to bless you again and again. Because his word says in the morning, so thy said, and the evening we told not thy hand. For thou knowest not whether shall prosper either this or that. Or whether they both shall be alike good. So it is offering time. And I'm very sure that Almighty God will remember your offering and minister to all your names in Jesus' mighty name. The choir will lead us as we take our offering this afternoon. Hallelujah. We thank you, Jesus. Oh, oh.
Hallelujah. Shall we please pray? Everlasting Father, once again, we want to thank you for the power in the world. Take all the glory, honor, and adoration in Jesus' name. That day with this offering, we are saying a very big thank you. Please accept us and accept the offering in the name of Jesus. Any one of us in financial mess, please let there be deliverance by fire in the name of Jesus. Bless us bountifully in the name of Jesus. Every sin that we have been sowing, bring to remembrance in the name of Jesus. And open the windows of heaven and bless us so much that very soon, no matter the situation now, we'll be able to say the Lord has been so good to us. Thank you, Father, for hearing us. And for your son that you have used for us, our daddy, daddy, bless Bless him abundantly, the more in the name of Jesus. And in your kingdom, every one of us, count us worthy to reign with you. Thank you, Father. Blessed be your holy name. In Jesus' wonderful name, we have prayed. Amen. Let somebody shout another hallelujah. God bless you. In any condition we are, God is there for us. God of the valley, the God of mountain, God of mountain is God of the valley. So your hope continually should be alive. Begin to appreciate God, that you are a child of God, you have the backing of God, you have the presence of God. In any situation, you are not alone. God is there for us. Appreciate his holy name. Thank you for this world that has come in a season. Ah, that makes sure you to know that in any situation, you are an overcomer. You cannot be defeated. You cannot fail. Because our God is God of all situations. Begin to thank him more than ever before. Even after you have left here, still continue to praise him. Because his presence is always abide with us. In Jesus' mighty name, we have given thanks. Heavenly Father, we just say thank you. We cannot thank you enough for the kind of God we have. A good father, a caring father, a loving father, who is always with us at every given situation. We thank God because we are alive today to even hear what we are hearing and for our eyes to see what we are seeing. Thank you for raising our hope again. Thank you for raising our confidence. Thank you for raising our faith. Be thou exalted in the name of Jesus. Our Lord and our God, we call upon your name right now. Those of, of your children that are experiencing a valley experience, even at this point in time, and they have been saying, when am I coming out? I, because of the word and the power that is in the word, I decree to your life, you are coming out of the valley in Jesus' name. Because the God of the mountain is the God of valley. Whatever challenge facing you now, that you think there will be no solution, before you leave here today, before the conclusion of this service, solution is your portion in Jesus' name. And everyone that is on mountain, that everything in Rosil are joyful, Lord, you are on top, you will not come down in Jesus' name. God that has brought you to the top will be by your side in Jesus' name, and your joy will be everlasting in Jesus' name. We want to thank and give glory to God for our beloved daddy that God has used, our father and the Lord, the general of the Redeemed Christian Church of God, Pastor E. Adeboe. We pray that God will keep you for us in Jesus' name. Amen. We will locate your life in Jesus' name. He will increase your strength and anointing in Jesus' name. We pray also for mommy, bless mommy in Jesus' name. Keep her for us in Jesus' name. Sending them at all times in Jesus' name. All this word that we are hearing, we pray. None of them will condemn us in the last day in Jesus' name. In Jesus' mighty name, we are prayed.
Jump.